Get ready to quit the build. The QTB crew is rounding up all the gaming news and hot topics of the week with a little extra something. And here are your hosts, Bruno, Brad, and Nick. What it do? Welcome to the QTB podcast. My name is Nick, and I am joined by the one and only QTB's Brad. What's going on, my man? Nick, what is going on? It's another episode 98, right? Episode 98. We're closing in on triple we're closing digits. closing in. And yep. when we get this close to such a monumental occasion, we get special guests, right? Yes, we do. Who, who That's we got right. here with us today, Nick? Oh, tell us, tell man, our audience man, we, we got to we got a treat here, okay, because we have got one of our QTB Network partners, none other than Chris from One Hour, One Decision, an Xbox Game Pass podcast. Chris, welcome to Quit the Build, man. It's been too long. <laughs> it's been a while. Actually, it was, uh, we were just talking about it before that we went live. Um, it's been a year since we actually- It's been a while. On, on a uh, podcast. So yeah, thank you guys for having me. And uh, yeah. I appreciate being part of like almost triple digits. This is pretty cool. So. Yeah, we're sneaking up on it, man. If you count yeah. like the bonus episodes and all that, we're we're pretty much already there. But uh, awesome. yeah, who's who's really counting? Uh, but for, yeah, for the, so uh, for the home podcast, it's we're 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 right there. We're getting there. Awesome. That's right. But yeah, so we uh, we will be having some uh, some guests uh, from the, the QTB network and beyond, kind of rotating through uh, over over the coming months. So very exciting times and just a lot of fun stuff going on for the network. Um, and a little bit later, we're going to be talking about one hour, one decision, what you guys have got been have, have going on. Just talk about the podcast because it's one of my staples. I love, I love a short podcast, you know, <laughs> St- too few people you can figure out like, okay, we're going to, we're going to come up with a format that like, you know, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes and we're, we're, we're good. You know, that, that fits comfortably into anyone's lineup. So we're going to, we're going to sell the heck out of this thing, Chris. I appreciate it. <laughs> you, you know what it. else is we're going to sell Nick is Tell our me. Q- QTB Legends podcast Ooh. just dropped the other day, episode three with none other than Don Traeger, co-founder of EA Sports. And this one is focusing on his time where he got his start at Atari. So, I mean, tell him about it, Nick. How great was that episode? Incredible episode. You know, we've been kind of, there's just so much to talk about in Don Traeger's career, of course, one of the co-founders of EA Sports. Um, but, but even, you know, before that, these are the Atari years that we're talking about. And that we're talking about legendary stories about the founding of, you know, 720 skateboarding that quite literally created the skateboarding genre, subgenre of sports. Uh, we're talking about Marble Madness, one of the greatest video games ever made. Paperboy, I mean, come on, the list goes on and on. So yeah, definitely check that out. It's on. If you're listening to this on the on the QTB feed, uh, we actually put the Legends episodes on that 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 RSS feed. So Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever, you've probably already seen it in your queue. Definitely check out those episodes because we've got uh, more from Don coming, and we've got more from other legends of the gaming industry lined up as well. Well, on uh, without further ado. We've got some news to talk about, so let's just jump right into it. Our first story coming from PCGamer.com, uh, talking about the uh, the Kingdom Hearts 4 trailer. You want to talk about a surprise? I mean, you know, we... I, I, look, I, I am a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a tried-and-true Kingdom Hearts fan. I've played just about every one of, even like the the obscure games, um, because I there's just something about it that just captures a, a moment, a time in my life when that was, you know, in its prime Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. Um, and this impossible mashup of Square Enix and Disney. Um, and, you know, with the wait that we had for Kingdom Hearts 3, what was it, like, like 12, 12 years between 2 and 3? Something like that, something dumb. Um, so we, we got this trailer for Kingdom Hearts 4 during one of the uh, anniversary presentations for Kingdom Hearts this week alongside the announcement of another mobile game. Before we get into some of the speculation behind it, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, are you... What's your take on just like Kingdom Hearts as a whole? Because it it seems like it is one of the most divisive game series I have ever experienced in terms of fandom online. Either you are all in on it or you just could not care less. Yeah, I am the latter. Um, <laughs> in this case, it's, it's not even about that. Like, I, like the, the concept is pretty cool. Being able to like interact with, you know, Disney characters and stuff like that. It definitely seems like it'd be appealing, but like, I, I don't know. I just, I think I grew tired of like that style of game for a bit. So, um, so yeah, I, I, 
like for me, I just want to get in and start playing. I don't want to be like clicking through a a menu system to do attack. So I, I though I I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the later versions of the game are more real time or like in terms of the. Yeah, I mean the combat's always been real time, oh, it's always but been it real-time. has that it has that command menu, right? That you do have to like you use your D pad to work your way through as you're as you're playing. Future games made it a little more streamlined, okay. where it wasn't quite as cumbersome to like go in and like like select a certain spell or use a certain yeah. item. But um, yeah, it's the, the, for the most part the game has been it, it has been real time, but it definitely has its clunkier moments, right? Yeah. But no, I. I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and I already yeah. know I'm going to be the Kingdom Hearts fan in the room, so <laughs> I'm probably going to be the guy to talk about it. But I'm just curious to hear your takes on it because, um, you know, it is it is a very much a, a well-known franchise, right, and one that was very much a defining part of the, I think, the PS2 era of gaming, right, one of the, I think, flagship titles, really, for the PS2. And, I mean, Brad, you look at what, at what Fortnite has done for the crossover, or even Super Smash Brothers has done for the concept of, of a crossover from, from more than just Nintendo. But I really think if you go back into gaming, I think Kingdom Hearts is kind of one of the OGs of just taking these wildly different worlds of, of Disney and Square Enix and saying, you know what, we can not only mash these two things together, but we can create these new storylines and and memorable it just it just it's it's it, it really has become its own thing despite being the product of two different franchises wouldn't you agree exactly i think that's the business model at hand here right and that's why i think that's you're seeing these significant gaps between releases is because of the landscape that's changing on the business side how many acquisitions how many new titles has disney put out in the last decade i mean you can roll through them right i mean you can think of um, you know, we've got all of, you know, think about ownership of Marvel, Marvel, their acquisition of Fox. I mean, all of the Pixar movies. I mean, um, you know, all of the Disney pro- productions that have come out, you know, that, you know, I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, Zootopia, Moana, Wreck-It Ralph. I mean, the acquisition of Fox would give you access to The Simpsons and King of the Hill. Obviously, Marvel could bring in some really, you know, all of our super favorite Avengers and their settings of where they live, you know, Asgard or Wakanda or Whatever, right? So think about the new platforms, new worlds that now could be crossed into the mix with the newest release. And that's why it's taking, I think, so much time for them to figure out what they want to make this next iteration of the game. Because I think we've had so many cartoony worlds before. There's been a lot of crossover with the original Disney characters with Mickey and Donald. And not saying that we want, don't want that anymore, but I think there's this next level of access now to these this crossover functionality that you're talking about that from a business standpoint makes 100,000% and is why they should do it. it, it that's going to make this game successful is, is these new crossovers that we haven't seen yet and these new storylines that will be one of a kind to this game. Right. One of the one of the biggest downsides to Kingdom Hearts right now that makes it it's a barrier to entry is it is a confusing game. Even some of the most diehard like lore fanatics behind Kingdom Hearts still can't universally agree on like certain parts of the lore because they have fleshed it out uh, kind of uh, kind of laterally so much um, that there's there's some depth to it. But man, there's all these different games and there was a flip phone game that had plot, you know, and they had to create like a movie out of it so that you could actually like know what happened. They have had live. Con- I'm not kidding. They have had live concerts of Kingdom Hearts music where cutscenes have played that you can't see them anywhere else. And they have lore in them that you can't get anywhere else. So to actually be up to speed on the Kingdom Hearts world, you had to go to a limited run uh, live live concert. That's how just wacky it's gotten. Um, are one you, of the mobile are, are games. You are you Kingdom? Are you are our Kingdom Hearts <laughs> lore expert here? I'm you, not. You seem I'm to know. really not. Have you been I, to the musical? <laughs> I haven't. But what, where it gets really crazy is, you know, they had a, a mobile game. Um, it's called like a Union Road something or other um, that is is no longer offered. It was a live service game, and over like the four or five years that it came out, it was nothing but plot, just plot, 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 plot. But now it's gone. So you now once again you have to basically watch a movie that they gave you to like recap a mobile game. Otherwise, like Kingdom Hearts three that just came out, the the game won't make sense. Wait, but so I, I could tell, go on for you're hours. Telling me, yeah. You're telling me there's something bigger than the MCU and it's the KHU? Well, I'm glad you me? mentioned 
I'm glad you mentioned the MCU, Brad, because that's exactly why we're talking about this story from PC Gamer. So I did just uh, accidentally flash it across the screen there, but I'm going to show you something <laughs> very interesting from the trailer. Um, and that is this picture right here. So in this new trailer, we see Sora, a very much a modern take on Sora, more realistic than we've ever mm -hmm. seen before. It looks like just modern day Japan um, that Sora wakes up in. And uh, we, we believe this is its own world. And that, that does happen in the Kingdom Hearts world. Sora will take on kind of a different look. Like in the Pirates of the Caribbean world, he has more of a rough, ragged, you know, pirate look. And in Toy Story, he becomes a toy. Um, but in this case, it, it, this, no, we don't see Sora in this shot. But you, you, you might notice up here, um, and again, if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're listening, you'll want to check out the video podcast on YouTube or Spotify. Um, but there is a very specific looking almost like foot and this is like a forest jungle scene okay um, and for some reason we're seeing this and it just flashes by for a second well a lot of people are speculating that this in fact could be the foot of an ATST from Star Wars and that is really what's got people going nuts right now and it makes perfect sense right because Disney uh, when Kingdom Hearts 3 was being produced over its, what, 12-year development cycle? Um, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that. But they, you know, they didn't have the rights to Disney, you know, for that entire stretch of time. Now they, now Disney rather doesn't have the rights to uh, Star Wars and, and Marvel. Now they do. And it, it especially makes sense, you know, you mentioned the MCU, Brad. It really makes sense for them to bring in not only Star Wars, but definitely Marvel right? Because Square Enix has created Marvel games, right? They made Marvel's Avengers and they made Guardians of the Galaxy. So I think, you know, this would be such a great, I think, new jumping off point for a new generation of Kingdom Hearts. Let's get in those new Disney IPs. I mean, admittedly, Chris, I know you said you're not, a, you're not the biggest Kingdom Hearts fan, but if now you got Sora with a lightsaber, you know, out there fighting with, with Iron Man and, and you know, uh, all the greats, Captain America, you'd Captain probably America check out that shield, game, right? Thor's hammer. I mean, come yeah. on, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Cool. Uh, or, like, ride around in Bart's skateboard, since that's a <laughs> yeah. Marvel property, you know, or <laughs> oh, a Disney property. Oh, that's true. You know? Be oh, cool. man. Yeah, Simpsons yeah, I, arcade level. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, get I'd that play in that. there. Have that as a uh, uh, an Easter egg kind of thing to get that in there. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, like I, the appeal to of this game for sure is like being able to interact with all these different properties, and it's it's going to be it looks fun. Like, do they even give an announcement of like when it's actually going to be released, or they just said it's it's no. happening? Yeah, with the, this, this was a complete. We got blindsided by it, right? Okay. A lot of people are saying twenty twenty three. But it, what we have to remember is that when Kingdom Hearts 3 was announced, I want to say about eight years before its release, they were showing cut like like in-game footage. Um, now, they ended up changing. I think they, mo they moved over to another development engine, and that was one of the big reasons why it took so long to make. But it doesn't change the fact that, I mean, that's just an absurd amount of time to wait. So most people, myself included, are just going automatically going the the, the maximum pessimist route. <laughs> and saying there is no way I am playing this game until like 2030. That way, if it if it does, <laughs> if they over deliver, you know, it'll be it'll be a pleasant surprise. But I mean, we just saw that. My goodness, with was it uh, Perfect Dark, right? We got that that teaser trailer. And now it sounds like the studio um, that's behind it is just in complete disarray. So I mean, Brad, I think I think we're gonna have to just go like the just full pessimist, right? And say, yeah, if we get it, it's great. But I I don't see it happening anytime soon. Well, I mean, that's just been what we've talked about over the course of several episodes lately is is game development time and expectations, right? What gets advertised, what gets leaked, what gets you know previewed, and what what expectations that sets with your audience, and then can you deliver, right? So it's almost, you know, is it better to give someone or give the audience a preview of what could be coming in five, seven, ten years? Or is it better to sit back and just hold it close to your chest and wait till you've got something that's a year or two away? There's no perfect formula, but I think you have to follow what's historically been with Kingdom Hearts and that there is such a divi div divisive nature on this game that I think for the fans who love it, this was exactly what they needed to, you know, bide their time for another five, seven years. For the pessimists, it's going to be, yep, there you go. See you never, right? Like, see you, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be a dad of five by then, right? So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just, it, it, it helps fuel the fire for both sides. And so you just got to 
dig into your side and know, yes, I'm a fan. I'm waiting for it. I'll, I'll bide my time or, <laughs> you know, good luck. You know, good luck. You people who play that <laughs> game. I, I, I'll have played a hundred games by the time that comes out. Right. Yeah. So especially if I do it in an hour. <laughs> It's right, tough. <laughs> you know, I, I will admit, Chris, I'm a little I'm a little salty that you guys didn't land on Kingdom Hearts three, you know, before <laughs> it, it left Game Pass. I probably should have told you just to given you a request oh, to play it. Right. But I mean, it would have been one of those things where we were just talking in the pre-show where like, you know, so many of these games and Kingdom Hearts is no different. It's there's so much setup and cutscene after cutscene. And like it's it, one hour would not be enough time to even begin to play it. I don't think you, you almost would have to pick a new game <laughs> if I'm probably. being honest. Oh man, it's yeah, um, it's it's crazy. Though. Like this this whole series, um, like. But going back to the idea of you know wh- whether people are, are eager to be waiting and stuff like, like, because you know Blizzard did that for years, where they just like I'm we're, we're only releasing the game when it's ready, and they, like they weren't looking at you know pleasing the uh, um, the shareholders or whoever it is, the board directors. It was just like well, when it's when it's done, it's done, and then that was it. Um, I think, I think a lot of times the development studios have to have that trust from the, you know, the people that play their games. And I'm, I, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it, it bites them in the ass, like with, um, uh, CD project red, right? Like they, yeah. they had, they said it was going to get done when it's, when it's done. And then they rushed it out and it, you know, kind of mm. was not great. But um, I'm, yeah. I'm sure they're trying to do their thing. But. Does that beg the question though? Is is it a lack of understanding now with the with the current gamer of what it takes to put out that quality of a game, or is it is it is it instant gratification expectations? I mean, how how do we find a balance from letting developers have the time they need to put out a really quality title, but also holding them to some type of standard where it doesn't take them a decade? Because then there's no business there, right? There is a business now, but the gaming industry is rapidly growing it's massively successful esports is taking off i mean it's becoming mainstream so at some point there are going to be shareholders there's going to be businesses there's going to be owners who expect these developers to more or less operate like a machine and be able to put out titles at a, at a certain pace that please their audience and deliver financially so it, i think you're going to see a struggle between shareholders the developers themselves who are passionate and want to put out a quality top end pot product and then their fan base who is constantly itching for something new right nick yeah it's 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 we've talked about this before on the show right we had that whole issue with scale bound where you know the the japanese uh, uh mentality of game development still is and thank goodness um you know we'll release it when it's ready right they are much less likely to uh to cave in to release a game and i will say the kingdom hearts games much like anything else that square enix puts out with the exception of live service games um the avengers was a mess um that they they do provide a, a quality product you know at the end of the day so i i am more than happy to wait it's just the problem is that kingdom hearts 3 did not make people happy in terms of plot resolution because they had been waiting for so long and it with all these extra games it felt like Kingdom Hearts 3 was supposed to be the Avengers end game of the Kingdom Hearts series right and close out an arc before starting a new one and it didn't do that it really didn't do that it just raised more questions and anything it was really the Shenmue 3 of of what we got with Kingdom Hearts where it was just like man we waited all that time and this is what we got um there's actually a lot of parallels there where it was just mostly filler and then like you know 30 minutes of actual story and you ended up right back where you were before. Um, so it, it's, it's challenging, but uh, right now it's just a waiting game. Now we are going to get some other content in the meantime. They did announce another mobile game set in the kingdom hearts world. We'll see what they do with that. Again, if it's anything like the other ones, you're going to have to play it. If you really want to know, you know, what's going on in this just very interesting and unique world, but nonetheless, um, I am very, very excited to see if if Disney fully utilizes their stable of of game offerings um, and franchise offerings. I can't imagine why they wouldn't. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go. You know, a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars has done everything else, right? Why not? Why not Kingdom Hearts? I'm ready. <laughs> it would be a major. It, it would cause the fan base to continue to have the have a similar reaction to Kingdom Hearts four as they did to three. If yeah. they do not utilize every crossover that they have at their disposal. It's a missed opportunity. It really That's is. That's it. We're in the era of crossovers, right? So yeah, you gotta you gotta get with the times, or uh, or just just don't get with anything. Well, I'll tell you what uh, we do have to uh, get with, and that is our amazing Patreon supporters. 
uh, such as Epic Capture Productions and our newest QTB and Fuego supporter, both Epic Capture Productions and our newest one, Matt.Bat. Thank you so much getting access to that exclusive merch you can't get anywhere else. We do appreciate it very much. Also, our QTB Plus supporters, Nick Nick, the Dudist Monk, Indie Gamiacs, Alan Abadessa, Mr. Grove Games, and the Intergalactic Pinecone. If you're watching this live, don't worry. I added the password theme in post-production. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Bruno would normally push the button. I promise you're going to get it. Uh, but please uh, stop on by patreon.com slash quit the build. Tiers start as low as $2 per month, and we're going to give you access to all sorts of amazing bonus content like our QTB Nostalgia Vault and our $5 tiers enough give you an, uh, a shout out like you just heard on each and every episode of Quit the Build. Thanks, as always, everybody, too, for uh, your support. Well, guys, we have got to go into our next story here from IGN. Talking about that that ever-elusive Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. I mean, it's it's one of those games where, you know, I you, you expect delays. I, every time we get closer, you know, to their, them announcing an announcement... It ends up being, you know, oh, well, yeah, inevitably, oh, we, we had to delay it for whatever reason. Not that they give specifics. They're very vague about it. But there seems to be a little bit of a conspiracy theory here brewing. Uh, and this story talking about how Breath of the Wild 2 might end up being another cross-generation title. So this article talking about how a lot of tech experts have analyzed um, the most recent round of footage based on screenshots that have come out for Legends of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2 um, and saying that it may be way too st- uh, powerful with what they're showing to run on current gen hardware. Okay, now we've talked for a long time. The gaming industry as a whole has talked a long time about the the uh, elusive Switch Pro that never happened. Right? It seems like they've they've kind of moved away with that with that OLED announcement of yeah, you get a better display, but that's that's all you get. But this story, and of course, Digital Foundry, which they are just the, they are the gold standard of really breaking down game performance uh, comparisons. And of course, in this case, looking at these screenshots and kind of reverse engineering, can the Switch really run this? Um, And they're skeptical. Now, there's some validity to this because it is very rare for Nintendo to put out any kind of, of gameplay footage or cinematic anything that is above and beyond how the game actually runs. They want to show you what you know. What you see is what you're going to get. So it, it's unlikely that they're showing us something where we're going to get a downscaled version of it when it eventually comes out. But yeah, this this story basically saying, look, you know, just based on the in, incredible graphics and a lot of the the special effects that are being shown between the original trailer that we saw and these new screenshots, the speculation is that this is going to be just like Breath of the Wild was a cross gen. Uh, between the Wii U and the Switch, that this is going to end up being stalled out so that whenever they announce that that next console, and it's got to be coming soon, um, that they can say, hey, Breath of the Wild 2 is going to be available on it. Chris, do you think that there's any any merit to that conspiracy, or is it just another case of a, of a eternally delayed game? Well, um, it came from IGN, so I guess it's not Kotaku, so we have, there's some validity there, right? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, I like this guy, <laughs> but, but you know, like uh, anything's possible. Like the, the, this, the Switch Pro rumor was was going on for years. How long? How old is the Switch now? Uh, Switch came out on, in 2017, uh, so it's 17. going on oh, five, yeah, five years, six years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Six it's years, a, it's yeah. about time for them to announce something else. Yeah, so. I, I mean, it, it makes sense. It totally makes sense. Um, and. I, I know people are, are super excited about this game and want to want to get get going on it. But, you know, Nintendo's going to do Nintendo's going to do what Nintendo does and they'll just release it however they want. And, and people will buy it in any way that they comes out to, you know, um, I always say we're talking about the company that when everyone else was saying virtual reality, they were saying cardboard pianos <laughs> <laughs> buy our cardboard kits right. so yeah i mean nintendo is uh they they just march to the beat of their own drum i mean what, what's your take on it brad do you think there's that uh, this is there's some kind of uh validity to saying they're intentionally stalling it I, I i would say probably not but i mean i'm curious about your take it's hard to say where i struggle is that i feel like nintendo to your point about always beating to its own drum Nintendo's never wowed people with their graphics. Their game platforms, their game titles, the way that they run has never been about realism or, um, you know, uh, graphics cards and and basically, you know, what the, what the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are trying to be. 
So I feel like it's kind of a little bit um, off off their road, off their identity to now be looking to push into some type of next gen high higher graphics platform. I mean, I, I know they need to continue to push their their systems, but it, it seems a little a little suspect to me that this is what they're focusing on rather than the the quality of titles and exclusives that they have. Uh, and so I'm wondering if this is just kind of a rendered out, you know, clip or rented out footage that they they did elevate for to get people appetizing over the quality of, of Breath of the Wild 2, not so much about the po- possibility of of a next gen console. Um, it would be scary to think that they're developing games that are going to really max out the capabilities and the, and the performance of the Switch because then what are you doing? Then you're putting yourself in a hole that you have to come out with something that can perform. So that doesn't sound like Nintendo. Nintendo's never made any bad business moves. They've always been able to be sound in what they do, stick to the IPs, and and do that when they want. So to me, this is really probably just a pointed effort to make Breath of the Wild 2 look like it's going to be the best, you know, open world concept exploring, tour, you know, kind of game that we, we're going to get on that platform. Not so much a you know, indirect, you know, foreshadowing of a new console. I wouldn't yeah. call their business model airtight. They made the <laughs> virtual boy. <laughs> well, okay. And I, I mean, had it. <laughs> I know, I know what you mean though. I, yeah. but, but I mean, you, you, you can see how in some ways we've talked about how PlayStation and Sony are now trying to, they're, they're competing with Microsoft and Xbox with the game pass and that business model of, stream to play and now yeah. they're trying to respond and it's a chess match where they're behind two moves mm. nintendo has never factored into that battle per se they're kind of doing their own thing they've got their own platform their own services everything i mean you know you you have the family plan with the switch and it's a great it's a great value right so i mean there's no reason for them to have to feel like they have to compete in that arena where it's high-end performance graphics uh, you know, basically it's a, like a, a supercomputer, right? That's never been their need. That's never been their identity. So I don't see why maybe in their own way, they're going to try to find a way to continue to push their graphics. But, you know, this to me is just a way to market that Breath of the Wild 2 is supposed to be a wow. It's a wow factor. Not so much. I mean, what what is the next generation console really going to really provide that is going to make you want to buy it? That's a, that's a fair question. What what would make you want to upgrade from your Switch, Nick? What 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 would you need? Tough to say. Really tough to say because the Switch, you know, you're right. It's not about performance so much as it is about the portability and the and the family friendliness of the titles they put out. But sooner or later they're going to. It's just a matter of how they, they choose to go about it. You know, the the Switch was the great merger for them, right? Of their their handheld lines and their home console lines, right? It ending the you know, the 3DS being the final thing that they made. Um, you know, that uh, it's it's no surprise they would go this route. And now they're even, you know, going heavy into the mobile gaming space too. So I, I think we probably still have a few years left on this thing. And if they mm-hmm. are truly delaying this to spring 2023, like they said, that doesn't really line up with the the, the lifespan of a, of a console, right? Um, so, I mean, could they eventually release like a, uh, you know, an, an enhanced version for whatever the next Switch, the next Nintendo console is going to be? Breath of the Maybe. Wild 2 Definitive Edition. <laughs> oh, boy. Don't give many <laughs> Sorry. ideas. I know. <laughs> I but but your, point, yeah, go ahead. your point's valid, though. Like, yeah. if they're merging portability with their their titles, you're re- going to reach a finite ability to provide that tech performance. You mm-hmm. know, for, in terms of size, weight, and actual portability that's going to deliver that performance without there being any issues or it being very fragile and yeah. not being able to play it and, and take it with you. Right. And, and, and cost. Right. If you're going to make something that high end that you can take with you and plug in and, and take on the road, that's going to cost a pretty penny. And you got to wonder who what their demographic is, who their market is. Are they going to really want to buy that or afford to be able to buy that? There's a lot of questions from the business side that I, it just doesn't seem to me like they're going to have this high end mobile portable switch pro that delivers the next level or comparable level of performance and technology to the, the series X and, and the PS five. So um, to that, I guess I'll ask this question then regarding, I mean, I know for the most part, Nintendo goes to the beat of their own drum, but do they feel any sort of pressure from like the steam deck? Mm. You know, there is that right. And then yeah. there's the, there's also the possibility. I mean, there, there could be some other like backend fanciness that they could be doing with breath of the wild. Like they could be using, 
they could be offloading some of the graphic stuff to like st- like streaming. Like I know I, I don't know if you guys remember back in the day where um, Microsoft was like like was pushing this whole thing. Like I think it was with Crackdown Three where they were trying to offload a lot of the graphic stuff to the the cloud, like the Azure cloud stuff, so that like you know, they could do destructible environments, like fully destructible yeah. environments like that. Right. Um, like could they do that with Breath of the Wild? And but to your point, if they are uh, Brad, to your point with with them doing like up rendering stuff, like then could people be disappointed when they actually play the game and they say this game doesn't look that good as as what they're showing in these screenshots? Like, there's I mean, there's a fine line, of course, but you know, it is. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of little things you have to work out here, right? I mean, as far as the Steam Deck is concerned, um, uh, there's a, I mean, the the pricing isn't even close, right? The Switch Lite, two hundred bucks right now. If you manage to get a Steam Deck at MSRP, the cheapest <laughs> model, right, the sixty four gigabyte, that was a four hundred dollar purchase. Um, so I mean, you know, that they, they still have that value proposition of being the family friendly and affordable option for for gaming as an all in one solution, but. You know, there's there's just a lot of uh, interesting ways to look at like what what the next five years are going to look like for Nintendo. I think people understand like what the path is for PlayStation or what the path is for Xbox, but the path for Nintendo, you know, it there's always unknowns, and I don't think even they know up to a certain point what that next play is going to be. Um, you know, if anything, it, Chris, it feels, I'm just excited. What's that? I was say it feels kind yeah. of where I felt right like before the Wii U came out. Like I feel like there yeah. there's these points in their business model and their in their journey where yeah you wonder what's next and then they surprise you Mm -hmm. so i'm not worried about seeing what it's going to be i think they're going to come out with something that's going to be completely different than what we've got right now because joining the group with xbox and playstation just means you're just throwing your hand into a a, 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 too many hands in the same pot right like they're building their own pot that's going to sit across the table and then they're right. going to be only hand in there and they want you to come over there and see what's in the pot versus sticking around with Xbox and, and PlayStation. So I really think whatever it's going to be, it's going to be something we haven't seen before. And it will probably benefit their their IPs and their exclusive titles. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, if anything, uh, you know, I'm just what I was going to say, Chris, is <laughs> as much as you guys have to talk about Xbox Game Pass, you know, you're locked into that <laughs> format. It must be nice for you to finally talk about just like Nintendo or a, a different console for once, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't really, really get to play my Switch because my kids have, uh, you know, taken that hostage. But right. Uh, but like for, yeah. But for the most part, it's just like uh, uh, to to you guys' point about their graphical quality and all stuff. They don't need to do that because of the art style that they go with too. Like I know Tom and I talk about this a lot too, where it's like if you stick to a particular art style, if you're not trying to go for realism, you're not trying to do all that, uh, and it, these games will look great for. A very long time yeah um and that's why like you know breath of the wild like uh, mario galaxy still looks great and mm-hmm. um so yeah i i think they can keep doing what they're doing and 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 things will be fine people will be happy with it like it's, yeah they're they they have their own right their way, it's way a of doing different it's like. a different demographic right yeah, yeah. it just yeah. it really is you've got the adults who are nostalgic and have been nintendo fans since the original console that still want it but now you're talking about the next generation of kids, your kids are, you know, eventually our kids who that's their first console. I mean, how many kids yeah. jump from being a toddler to just playing Nintendo or to, to an Xbox or a PlayStation? I feel like most people growing up our age had a Nintendo. Like that was the first one you had, right? So, I mean, I feel like that demographic's going to be different. I feel like, you know, and that really lends to your point about, okay, well, we can p- choose a particular art style that maybe gravitates and represents who we're going for a bit more versus the realism that can maybe feel a bit more adult or a bit more mature. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. It's just, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, we could talk for hours about just like the, the, the <laughs> bizarre world of, of Nintendo and the unknowns, right? There's, there's just, they're always the one that's like last They're the wild card. I mean, that's the only way you can describe them in the gaming industry from day one, right? They, they were a disruptor. And to this day, they're just a complete wild card. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, but I guess we'll see. I'm just, you know, I we we got a major delay the first time around where they're like, yeah, we can't do anything. Got to wait a year. And now it's, you know, hey, same thing. Spring of 2023. Got to wait a year. So we'll we'll see. But uh, I'm I'm in that same boat as with most of these new games of like, you know, I'll play them eventually. I guess maybe I'll get two or three more Zelda games in my lifetime. So you seem more <laughs> you seem more antsy with. Breath of the Wild 2 than you did with Kingdom Hearts 4. 
I look, I, you know, I still don't I even mean, understand the plot of the games I've been playing so far. So I am not in any rush to play. Kingdom Hearts 4 could come out tomorrow and I would be like, oh, OK, I guess <laughs> like I, I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it is, I like most fans. I have a love hate relationship with that. Whereas Zelda, you know, you can't you can't go wrong. That is that's that's just your your bread and butter of uh, of of adventure gaming, right? Is uh, is any kind of Zelda Zelda title? So, well, guys, as always, want to say thank you so much to our sponsor, PierceUnlimited.com, for marketing media that works and bespoke design to power your business. Visit PierceUnlimited.com today. Stop on by, check out all their amazing media consultation services. Uh, small businesses, big businesses, you name it, they have the marketing media solutions that you are looking for. Again, that is PierceUnlimited.com. Well, for our last segment here today, you know, since we have a, a very special guest, I wanted to bring in none other, of course, than Chris from One Hour One Decision and kind of talk about your podcast. You know, let the people know what's it about, what have you been doing lately, and uh, you know, what's going on in, in Tom and Chris land. <laughs> um, well, uh, the premise of the show, One Hour One Decision, is that we take a random game from Xbox Game Pass and then we play it for an hour. So, um, and then after that hour, we decide if we want to keep playing that game or not. And um, for people that aren't familiar, the premise came from my uh, being overwhelmed about the amount of content that Xbox had, or Game Pass had, <laughs> and being like, I don't know what to do. So then I found the surprise me button. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I clicked that and gave me a random game. I was like, all right, let's 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 go. Let's see how this goes. Um, so yeah, and and we've uh, what are we? We've gotten to episode sixty. Yeah, you're in the sixties. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just wow. you got that uh, Final yeah. Fantasy uh, thirteen. Yeah, and you guys yeah. have been, uh, you know, uh, very sticking to the format, right? I do like that. Recently, you've started to take viewer requests, right? Yeah. So if someone comes in and says, "Hey, we'd really like you to to bypass the Wheel of Fate, right, and right. And, and play this one particular game," I mean, yeah. you guys kind of have to be relieved when that happens, right? Because <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> man, it can be cruel. You, you uh, know what? Yeah. <laughs> the funniest thing is just that. Um, We've been getting a lot of sequels to games. We never get to play the first part of the <laughs> first part of the games, so it's it's been kind of frustrating about that. Uh, but uh, it, it's it, so yeah, like getting getting people to give us requests and like like obviously we have to make sure that we didn't play the game that they're suggesting, and um, and then and it also gives us an opportunity to play newer games too because I feel like a lot of the games that we're playing are pretty old. And people are like, oh, mm -hmm. we already know about this, like Goat Simulator. I was like, okay, well, whatever. It was part <laughs> of it, but yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, like uh, we, we, uh, I think this week we're going to be talking about a game that just recently came out, um, Weird West, which was it looked pretty cool. I heard, yeah, I heard some yeah. good things about it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we're, we're we played that game, and uh, we're going to be talking about that. And, and, so, uh, so, so I, I got to ask you, Chris. So you're, yeah. you said you're sixty some uh, sixty some on episodes in. And I, I can tell you, I think it's a really novel concept. One hour, one decision. I don't think I've ever done that before with a game. So what do you think you've learned from when you first started doing this with playing games to now? Like, how do you look at games differently? What, you know, do you find that you can really appreciate them more now that you only do it for an hour? Or like, what are some of the takeaways you've seen now over the time that you've started to do this? Uh, with Great the podcast? questions. I, like. That's it's probably why you guys get to do just some really good interviews, aren't you? <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I think the the thing that I've noticed is I've gotten more focused on like trying to get to the gameplay, trying to get to what it is that I can really uh, like about a game, and and I try to, I mean, I, I mean, I think Tom and I try to be as positive as possible with all the games because we understand as as game developers and stuff like that that. It, takes a lot of work to make these games right and um and so we we don't try to like bash as much as we can but uh we try to take it as positive as possible but but like also understand like does the game give us a a, a good understanding of how the game designers want us to play the game because like right. there's a lot of times where i mean like uh, i think we talked about this earlier like with final fantasy and, and these like these games where there's a lot of setup in kinder hearts um, sometimes it gets lost. Like you're, you're like, or I, I, one game I will forever never play, but uh, Scarlet Nexus, 
is another game where there was like a million tutorials and then there was so much plot in the beginning. I was like, I, I can't, I can't play this game. Like based on that hour, I can't play it. But like, I've seen other people play it. I've seen other people go through past that hour and they said the game is phenomenal. And then Tom actually got, uh, got into the anime and he said that was so much better yeah, because that. he could just watch it. <laughs> he could just watch it instead of playing the game. Yeah. So, um, cause like, yeah, like the, the world building in a lot of these games are, are really cool. And then, um, and the, and the, and the one thing I, uh, I've gotten to appreciate games that I probably would never pick up. Right. Um, there's been a lot of times like this game I beat, I, I literally beat it after I started playing it was the procession of Calvary. The game was just such a ridiculous game. Yeah. But it was so hilarious. Like, I mean, it got, it got, it didn't get as funny at the end, but, but it was still like, it, it cooked me and I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm good to go. Like, uh, yeah. Um, I still will die on my hill about roguelikes, but that is, <laughs> that's, that's my thing. It's it's kind of where the you know it's it's such a common thing to do now because it lets it lets indie developers create games that are that have replayability beyond right. the 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 size of their team right is mm-hmm. that it has those those random elements to it but yeah I also I I agree with you Procession of Calvary admittedly I I played it because you guys reviewed it but also because I heard that it is uh, one of those easy achievement games you know and I love farming those <laughs> Microsoft rewards points so I'm like okay I can hop in there and you know spank the bishop for an easy easy achievement uh, and uh um yeah but it's it is fun it's got that irreverent like Monty Python style humor and I've been yeah. I've been laughing out loud so much playing that game uh, I will definitely yeah. beat it and that's great Quirkus. because I would have never I would have never thought to touch that game right. if I hadn't heard that episode that you played it so I think what you're doing is a really important almost public service kind of guide and yeah. it kind of a, a random you know you're you're carving your own path where fate takes you rather than you know what what do I want to play? It's rather yeah. what does uh, you know RNG want me to play? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. fun. <laughs> as soon as Xbox removes that, I was like, okay, time to pack it up. It's like it's over. <laughs> oh, someone will make a someone will make a button. Trust right. me, no, someone will keep that alive. I'll uh, make it for you if I have to. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, and that's the beauty of the Game Pass, right? Is I think there, like you said, what the whole point of why you started this was there's so much content to get through. <laughs> It is daunting when you look at it and go, well, where do I start? What games do I really like? How do I even know? And so I, I, I'm i with you, Nick. I think it's a great public service for anyone who's got Game Pass who doesn't know where to start. Listen to the podcast. Find out what you could be interested in and get get some insight to know before you, you jump in. So, you know, hit that link. We got it here shown on the screen. Quitthebuild.com slash 1H1D for one hour, one decision. And check it out to really... Find out how you can maximize your money with your Game Pass and play the games you want to play. There you go. Don't be like me and get stuck on the menu of, of Game Pass. Just staring at it for an hour. What do I play? I've been there. I have been there too many times that I want to admit. And it's like yeah. it's like it's like picking a movie right on Netflix, right? You're yeah. like, what do you want to watch? What do you want to watch? And finally, when you get to the choice, your partner's asleep and you were down to just go to bed, right? I mean, yeah. So uh, no, I mean it. it great podcast it's helped me kind of pick some games too i'm not gonna lie and games that i normally wouldn't pick because I, f- I feel i pigeonhole myself i i really pick i stick with my bread and butters like you said nick you for you you know breath of the wild mm-hmm. for me i play a lot of Fortnite. i play a lot of halo i you know i've, I've played some assassin's creed in the past and so i kind of have a little bit there but i i, I need to branch out and in your podcast chris has really helped me feel more confident in 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 trying new things and finding that i can appreciate uh, different genres of games. Yeah. I just yeah, listen I mean, for when Tom gets upset about things. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> Good point. He's getting mad a lot. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. Well, hey, listen, Chris, thanks so much for coming on today. And uh, yeah, the uh, the link to uh, One Hour, One Decision will be in the show notes or the description for this episode. So uh, make sure that uh, everyone checks it out. And uh, we appreciate you uh, joining us for the fun today. It's awesome. Thanks guys so much for this. And Nick, you can't forget, you got to check us out too on all our socials. You got to get that merch, right? Oh, uh, get that merch, that swag, that squad, squad swag, of course, squad. at our merch page, quitthebuild.com. Uh, if you go there, you can go to our uh, slash merch or just go to our merch page. We have some amazing merch there. Um, if you are watching our podcast, you saw Brad just hold up the uh, the QTB retro vibe t-shirt, just full of that 70s rainbow effect cheese. You got to love it. Um, and, and of course, a lot of high quality. Yeah. 
high yeah. quality looks, t-shirt. Looks like a great super, shirt. Super, super comfortable, great cut, true to mm-hmm. size. I mean, you're, you're getting you're getting a high quality t-shirt that supports us, and you can rep us and support our brand and be a part of our community. Check it out on our website, quitthebuild.com slash merch. And go there, check out our community page, our blog. We've got a lot of great content on there. I mean, all of our socials, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, we got Mr. Quit the Build over here on TikTok, blowing it up, going viral. I mean, you know, oh, we've talked geez. about, Cur- I think if I, I, I've got Kirby balls playing in my head now without, <laughs> you know, without reason. And so yeah. uh, we're everywhere. Check us out. Come, come, come be a part of the family. Yeah, lots to love. And, uh, of course, on there, of course, our network page, you can uh, see all our network partners, just like Tom and Chris and our other uh, QTV network uh, partners, both in the, the content creation space, also music and streamers as well. Gotta love it. Well, guys, that's going to about do it until our very next episode. Chris, we didn't rehearse this, but at the very end, you're going to say, <laughs> for Nick and Brad, I'm Chris. Okay, here we go. Until next time, everybody, for Chris and Brad, I'm Nick. Uh, for Nick and Brad, I'm Chris. <laughs> And for Chris and Nick, I'm Brad. Peace out. What it do? Peace out.